house. <laughs> They're actually go. quite smart. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's your favorite trio. And we're back again for the first time in a while. We hey. are back as a trio because Ngum is with us. We have missed her. We're trying not to tell her how much we've missed her so her head doesn't keep expanding. But we really have missed Jingle from the bottom of our hearts. It was like, it was a hole here, wasn't it? Like, she's like, we were kind of like. I know, I know deep down in her, like, she's in my fan club. She doesn't like I to really show am. it. I don't like <laughs> to admit it. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, her son's fan club and I don't even try and hide it. <laughs> yeah, I don't like to tell her, but no, she was sorely missed. So we are back as a trio tonight, the uh-huh. dynamic trio that we are. Yes. Um, and. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to every single person that's reached out over the last couple of weeks and told us how much they enjoy our mm. musings, our conversations. Um, to those that have sent us messages of encouragement, we're really grateful. To those that have left reviews on the website, www.cwinuk.com org we are super grateful because we get to see those reviews and they're really encouraging so um god bless you um for encouraging us in the way that you do because it's it's wonderful to know that um our musings reach all corners of the earth and they are encouraging Mm -hmm. people in ways that we don't even begin to imagine and you can only really be god's doing um so we're not going to take any credit for that we give all credit and all glory to him because Mm -hmm. only him could take three women across three corners of England and Britain actually and yeah make it what it is so we're we're doubly grateful thank you Jesus um today we are visiting a woman in the bible and today's woman is Deborah or Deborah depending on how you want to say her name (laughs) I like that pronunciation, Deborah. Oh, lovely. Deborah. That is yes. so good. That is so good. Deborah. Oh, that Deborah. is. Deborah. Yeah. Mm. Us, us all call me, you just say Deborah. Yeah, yeah no. Actually, it's an anglicized thing. Mm. Deborah. 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 Mm, it would be nice to find a Jewish person to say it. How they yes, say it. Actually, that would be Deborah. cool. Plus, you know how when you listen to them, they always pronounce the names the way they should. Like they pronounce mm. Moses, Moshe. I like I it know. when they say it. I say. know. Yeah, not true. It's really cool. Okay, so she's quite a, a lengthy one in this book. So I think we're going to um, split her up. So I might start reading um, the first bit up until... Um, shall I do the first bit? And then Ngum, you do the yeah. second bit because is losing her voice. She's been doing a lot of talking and praying. Yeah. That's um, right. the last few hours so if I do up until say uh page 46 and then you can do 47 if I do up until where it says where it ends the battle you can start from Deborah's relationship with Barak up until the end yeah. all right yeah sure okay cool right let's go so Deborah her scriptural references come from Judges 4 um 5 um, she lived about 1300 BC and her name pronounced Deborah is means honeybee. Ooh. Um, I know we've got historical significance here. She led Israel as a prophetess and judge. The battle with the Canaanites in Deborah's time took place here and involved only a few of Israel's 12 tribes. So it says her role in scripture. The age of the judges was marked by repeated cycles of national sin, servitude, supplication, and salvation. When the Israelites turned aside to worship pagan deities, God permitted them to be oppressed by foreign powers until their distress became so intense that they turned back to him and prayed for relief. When God's people did return to him, the Lord raised up a judge who not only overcame the oppressors, but typically continued to lead his people and keep them faithful to him. Deborah was one of these unusual charismatic leaders who emerged in a time of great distress to lead God's people spiritually and politically. In Deborah's time, the king of Hazor oppressed the tribes of northern Israel, as seen in Joshua 11, 1-11. A century later, 
Joshua had destroyed Hazor, but the Canaanites had rebuilt the city and were once again the dominant local power. Sisera, the military commander under Jabin, the king of Hazor, commanded 900 chariots of iron. Until David's time, the Israelites lacked knowledge of iron technology. Thus, their enemies, like the Philistines, who had mastered ironworking, dominated them. Yet in response to a word from God, Deborah called out to, to the Israelites to do battle. She was held in such respect that the reluctant Israelites compiled, complied and 10,000 men assembled to confront the enemy. The story of Deborah focuses on a critical battle that took place on the flatlands near the Kishon River. Military strategists who have studied the geography and the reference in Judges um, 5, Verse 4, to the clouds pouring water, have explained how God enabled the relatively small Israelite force to defeat such a wonderful, such a powerful enemy. To reach the battlefield, the Canaanites would have had to dismantle their chariots and reassemble them on a flat plain. The heavy rains not only made reassembly difficult, but also thoroughly soaked the ground with the heavy chariots bogged down in the mud. The Canaanites were defeated and their commander was killed when he took refuge in a Kenite tent. The defeat was so decisive that within a few years, Hazor itself was destroyed and the northern Israelite tribes enjoyed 40 years of relative peace. Deborah was introduced in Judges as a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, who judging Israel at the time, according to Judges 4.4, these significant relationships help us understand this vital and unusual woman. Deborah's relationship with God in Judges 4.4, 4, Deborah is introduced as a prophetess. Prophets were significant people in Old Testament times. God chose these men and women to communicate his will to his people. Deuteronomy 18 reminds us that all the peoples of the ancient world sensed the need for supernatural guidance when circumstances forced them to make critical choices. The people of Canaan looked to mediums and spiritists. All these occult avenues were defined in Deuteronomy as detestable to the Lord. And so God promised to raise up individuals, prophets from amongst his own people, through whom he would speak and provide the guidance needed. God called men and women to be his spokespersons. Unlike other roles in the religion of Israel, this was not a cultic position such as, a, such as priest or Levite, and it was not hereditary. God called whomever he wished to be his spokesperson, and those he called, he confirmed as prophets and prophetesses in the eyes of the people. The first thing we learn about Deborah is that she had a special relationship with God. She had been called by him and commissioned to speak in his name. All Israel recognized that special relationship. In the words of Deborah's song, the prophetess loved God and as a result seemed like the sun when it comes out in full strength, as seen in Judges 5.31. Deborah's relationship with her husband. It may seem strange to us that while Deborah's husband is identified, he played no role in the story of the victory over the Canaanites. Since Israel was a patriarchal society, it is not surprising that Deborah should be defined as the wife of Lepidoth. Women throughout the Old Testament era were identified by the men in whose households they lived, whether their fathers or their husbands. The family belonged to the man. The woman belonged to the household. Some have felt that Deborah's position precluded her being so defined by her husband. They translate the Hebrew phrase as a woman of valor rather than the wife of Lepidoth. Yet the traditional translation is most likely and important. While Deborah was clearly an unusual woman, we need to remember, and the text emphasizes the fact, that Deborah's special role in scripture is not viewed as a challenge to the natural order of Old Testament society. She was a prophetess and is a leader in Israel. But Deborah was also a wife, a member of Lepidoth's household. 
There was no conflict between being a wife in a patriarchal, patriarchal age and being a spiritual leader. While the Bible text casts Deborah in a strongly positive light, the later rabbis, whose negative view of women is explored later in chapter one, were disturbed by the Old Testament's portrait of Deborah. They developed a play on Deborah's name, Honeybee, rendering it Hornet, in an attempt to ridicule her as a woman who overstepped her bounds. Despite the respect clearly shown for Deborah in Judges, the rabbis implied that she was an arrogant woman who stung rather than providing good things for her people. The reference to Lepidoth may well be included to suggest that while Deborah was a woman, while Deborah as a woman may have walked a social tightrope, she did so without behaving inappropriately. She lived as a godly woman, a special woman. At the same time, she was a wife whose virtue won the community's respect for her husband. Deborah's relationship with the Israelites. The Hebrew word for judging implies more than a judicial function. The judges were in fact spiritual, political, judicial, and in most cases, military leaders. During their lives, they functioned as the governments of the tribes they led, much as kings functioned in the following era. Deborah both fit and did not fit the pattern we see in the male judges. Deborah fit the pattern in that the people recognized her as the tribe's judicial political authority. Judges 4-5 tells us that she held court under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. Her duty involved settling disputes the Israelites were unable to resolve locally. Moses had filled this role before her, and as, uh, as had the other judges, the kings that followed her era also performed these functions. Clearly, Deborah was acknowledged, was the acknowledged leader of the Israelite tribes. It is appropriate to say that during her time, Deborah was leading Israel. Two things, however, set Deborah apart from other judges. First, she was a prophetess. None of the other judges, aside from Samuel, who was a priest, as well as a prophetess, are so identified. We can assume that Deborah was first recognized as a prophetess and that this special relationship with God preceded her recognition by the Israelites as a judge. Second, she was not a military leader. When Deborah was about to call on her people to fight the Canaanites of Hazor, she first summoned Barak a military man in the name of the Lord. She then passed on the instructions from God, which Barak was to follow. Strikingly, other judges were established as leaders in the sight of the people because they demonstrated military might, winning victories over God's enemies. Not so for Deborah. Exercising her prophetic gift, she appointed a man to command Israel's army. We can conclude from this that God did not want Deborah in the role of military leader. God had appointed Deborah as prophetess and judge and had communicated his intention to, com to commission Barak to lead the battle. Deborah's relationship with Barak. Judges 4, verse 8 and 9. Barak responded to Deborah's call and accepted the commission as army commander. But Barak placed a condition on its acceptance. If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. This reaction suggests the extent of Deborah's uh, credibility as God's spokesperson and as Israel's leader. Barak felt inadequate. He was willing to fight only if Deborah was present at the battle. Deborah accepted the condition but rebuked Barak. God had called Barak and, played, and promised him victory. Judges 4, verse 6 and 7. Barak should have placed his faith in God's word. Yet, Barak's reaction suggests how deeply the Israelites respected Deborah and her relationship with God. Barak viewed Deborah as a talisman, a symbol of the divine presence with his people. Deborah recognized Israel's need to see Barak as the military leader, placing herself in the background. 
Even when writing the victory poem we have in Judges, Deborah attempted to give Barak credit for the song. But while the verse credited Barak by name, the Hebrew was a feminine singular verb, Vatasha, literally, and she sang. This interplay suggests that while Deborah's special relationship with God made her the acknowledged leader of the Israelite tribes, her gender defined her, her gender defined those roles of leadership in which she could function with God's blessing. A close up. Deborah was a woman with confidence, was a woman whose confidence was rooted in a close personal relationship with God and in her ability, in her awareness that God had chosen to use her to guide his people. It is certainly true that Deborah's rule was not typical for a woman in a strongly patriarchal society. Yet Deborah clearly did not draw back, concerned about what others concerned about what others might think. Deborah had heard God speaking to her, and she was willing to put herself forward only because she knew that God had also chosen to speak through her. At the same time, Deborah was sensitive to the limitations of her sex. Deborah would settle disputes as any other judge, but she would not lead the army. The military role was one God chose to give to Barak, and Deborah clearly concurred. In fact, Deborah was not even comfortable with the role Barak insisted she fulfill. She would have preferred it if Barak had simply trusted God and gone off to battle without her. Deborah neither needed nor wanted any credit for the victory. What an unusual combination of traits Deborah displayed. She was self-confident and assertive, yet modest and self-effacing. She was bold enough to step out of the shadows in which most women of her time lived, yet she was unassuming enough to avoid the spotlight in a military campaign whose results would define her own leadership. In displaying these qualities, Deborah stands as a timeless example for the spiritual leaders of either sex. An example for today, Deborah reminds us that God does gift women for spiritual leadership. We do violence to scripture if we rule women out of the leadership, out of leadership solely on the basis of gender. At the same time, as military commander may indicate that not every leadership role is appropriate for women. Deborah was an obedient servant of the Lord and he blessed her with spiritual discernment. Certainly the roles of prophet and judge were more significant in Israel than the role of military commander. We must make sure that godly women have the opportunity to exercise the gifts given to them by the spirit. Deborah was a woman who balanced her many roles in life. She was a wife, possibly a mother, a prophetess, and a judge. In each capacity, the Lord gave her, in each capacity the Lord gave her, she served him competently. It is not always easy to balance our roles in life. Let's be sure that we seek God's guidance and, like Deborah, serve him in each of our callings. And that's it. Wow. What a powerful woman. She certainly yeah. took up a lot of space. Yeah. Book. Just end it there. Couldn't we just walk off and leave that? <laughs> a very, yeah, I mean, it's a great analysis. Really. Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you, the only other judge and prophet at the same time was Samuel. Samuel who was really special as well. No, 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 nobody else served as judge and prophet at the same time mm. other than Deborah and Samuel. Mm. Samuel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely powerful. Mm. Yeah. What, a gift. Yeah. what a woman. When you're, leading, when you're leading the group of St. Elizabeth, she was asking what we were reading from and explained what we were reading from. And she's asking, where can we find, where can I find this book? So okay. we'll, we'll leave details of the book um, in the group. Yeah, um, and, and, and another young lady to, earlier today bought the book as well, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. she did. Yeah, oh, she yeah, bought yeah, the yeah. book. Yeah, it's, an yeah. it's a great book. book. It really the publishers is. of this book need to give us a commission. Just they do, don't it. they? We're just <laughs> oh, I got mine from Amazon. I think it's an easy place to find it. Mm -hmm. We get yeah, it on Amazon. Amazon. You can get it on eBay. But yeah, yeah oh, we'll we'll leave yeah. details of of the book. Um, yeah. I'm dumbfounded by Deborah. Go oh, oh, how horrible those old rabbis, probably the Pharisees, try to, I, yeah. un try to undermine Deborah and change her name from Honeybee to Hornet. How dare they? 
Oh, you know what? Even Hornet is still appropriate because, you know, she discussed some things. Uh, I mean, I, how can I put it? I think for me, the, the thing with Deborah is that she, she shows that we make up a lot of things as human beings. We limit ourselves. People make up ideas in society, make up rules that limit people. But at the end of the day, nobody knows God's mind, right? Because I don't find it particularly strange that Deborah was raised to do this. It is only strange because she was in a society that had decided to box women like that. Yes, and maybe, but also maybe God was trying to show Israel that if your men think without them, like, you know, if the plan will go to pot, I will raise women to do the work that your men are supposed to do. You know, because up until that point, I mean, if you think of, you know, um, the foundation from Abraham, the fathers of the faith, you know, we talk about the fathers mm -hmm. of the faith. They'd had strong male figures. You know, you go through Abraham and, and Israel, um, Abraham, you know, Isaac, Israel, or Jacob, and then Noah, and then, you know, you, you, you sort of go Moses and Joshua, you go mm -hmm. through all these strong male leadership. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, then they go into this, into this um, thing where they're, they're obviously, they've lost their way again, um, as we often do as human beings. Um, and, and, but God is probably saying, look, you know, if, if there are no men to step up to the men plate, not all that. I will, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I will raise up a woman to do it. Yeah. And it's very interesting because if you take even Deborah aside, there's almost, there's a joke in politics sometimes that when a country is broken beyond repairs, give it to a woman, mm. you know? So this is a, a very good example of that. Like you said, it's not that women are not capable, mm. clearly. I'm sure even before Deborah, they were capable women, mm. but clearly Israel had some kind of um, arrangement, whether that was God designed or not, but it seemed to be working. <laughs> mm. And then it got to a point where clearly the men couldn't step up, mm. you know, and, you know, somebody else. And I think it's it's a very interesting thing with God that, if he asks you to do something and you don't do it, don't really think that you're all that. You'll mm -hmm. find somebody. Yeah. You know, oh, well, you'll find a way David and so <laughs> Oh, no, he'll be fine. If you're not going to do it, God will raise somebody else. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. Mm -hmm. Or he'll just like make a big whale yeah. to swallow you, as in one of my. Yeah. If you're Jonah, <laughs> if, if you're lucky enough to be Jonah, if you're lucky enough to be Jonah, a fish will swallow you. Because speak you out alive. He really wants you to do sense. that job. <laughs> but if you're tall, you might lose your throne. So mm. be careful. You never know which one you'll be. Exactly. But but you know, it's also interesting that God's not a God of chaos or confusion. Because even though he raises Deborah as a judge, he doesn't appoint her as military leader. Like he he still keeps the natural order which he has established from creation. Like he still makes sure that in the narrative that is passed down biblically, scripture, all the way 2,000 years later, we're still reading of her as Lepidoth's wife. Like, yeah, yeah. God's not a God of, because he, they could easily have left that part out and just, you know, just hailed her as this strong, independent woman, you know, riding over yeah. her husband. But you see, this is the thing that to me is very funny. I really don't see the contradiction. Like, I don't see why a woman, I, look, God has created everybody with abilities, right? And I don't see why a woman who is a strong leader, as Deborah clearly is, should have to ride over her husband. This is the bit that I don't understand. It's almost as if, and I really love Deborah because Deborah shows that women clearly can be in control of their emotions and balancing mm -hmm. things. A woman mm -hmm. who is doing well doesn't always have to ride over her husband. Mm -hmm. So... To me, I almost just see what Deborah is doing as a very natural thing. Mm, mm, but I think, you know, the, the I don't want to use the word most because then I'll have to prove that scientifically, <laughs> but some men, <laughs> yeah. some men would feel like if, if they were to let a woman, let's use, use very loosely here, 
But if they allow the woman to to maximize her God given abilities and and potential, then it's going to get to her head, and then they're going to get this you know wild woman running all over the place, bossing him around. I wonder why, given how many people, how many um, people, if we're looking at gender, have ruled the world and where we are today. <laughs> but you know. What I also would like is to see men, see men in the Bible who are just cool dudes, like Mr. Lapidus. <laughs> you well, know, yeah, just clearly, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a very good point. You know, he may have been encouraging her from behind the scenes. That's a very good point. Cool yeah. Yeah. Mr. Lapidus. Know, I think, I think that's our... Our... I think I think back to our conversation we had about Joseph, Mary's Mary's husband. Yeah. You know, it's like that guy, I want to meet him. It's like, yeah. you know, these are, and, and, and I know sometimes, not sometimes, very often it's said that, you know, then there's no, the world is lacking with like positive masculine role models or what a man should be or what a husband should be. But clearly mm. in the Bible, there are examples of, you know, God given masculinity and husbandship and what that looks like, because mm. you have husbands with women that are gifted like um yeah. deborah was and and you know her yeah. husband's obviously not tried to stand in her way and and guess yeah. what for that his name has been eternalized in scripture like and he didn't do anything so that, that's the reward even mr lapidus i want yeah exactly right because for all you know this man was behind the scenes clearly um encouraging her i can imagine oh, honey you can do it baby yeah there's a reason why he's mentioned like there's a reason apart from say um saying this woman didn't raise her head above the social parapet so much i mm. think it's also good for them to mention to say that yes this woman was married she had we don't know the details of the relationship but i find it very interesting that it's mentioned that mm. she was married because we see mm. other cases of someone like abigail yes <laughs> She has one and be married, right? So it's very interesting that you contrast that you see that there were some men who were really good men, mm -hmm. and clearly the exploits that this woman did in a patriarchal mm -hmm. society, that man must have gone against a lot of social norms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have a wife like that, so big up to him. And I wish more men would study men like him, yeah, men like yeah. the husband of the proverbs 31 woman because yeah you know these guys are comfortable in their own skin mm, mm. and 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 you know we we quite often say you know that we cry out for biblical examples of husbands but you know this guy clearly speaks okay. to this mm. guy's an example like he's an example yeah. of what it means to be married to a strong god gifted woman who is using her gifts to the service of mm -hmm. god but not Absolutely. placing it above her role as a wife and, mm -hmm. you know, not putting it above, because there's got to be a balance, right? We're not just speaking to men. We're also speaking to the woman to say, look, you know, just because you've been called in service does not mean mm -hmm. you've now got to think, you know, your husband and everybody else is beneath you. <laughs> like, that's we're not, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> no, no. And that's a very good point, because I think when you hear about people talking, even in this modern age, the I, I, ability to balance ministry and family yeah. seems to be quite an issue, you know. Um, of course, in our era, you probably see that more with men because it's been more men in mm. um, dominating pastoral roles, especially senior pastoral roles. Mm. But you often hear of this thing about, you know, the pastor who's doing all these amazing exploits, but mm. not really having time for their family. So again... Deborah seemed to have been able to manage all these things. Mm. And I think in an era where women have so many balls to juggle, mm. she's a good example to look at and to see how, you know, how do you fulfill all these roles mm. with God's guidance? Because I think it mm. talks here about her knowing what God wanted her to do. Yeah. Mm. And I think maybe that's where we we need to go or well let me speak for myself because there are times when you feel like oh I'm doing this I'm doing that I'm doing that but like did God even ask you to do it mm. I know that I don't always check yeah mm. you, 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 def you definitely have to make sure it's what God wants you to do and not out in your own because you'll fall flat yeah. in your face if it's out if it's out in your own idea yeah it really it, it exactly. really is but you know as you say Naomi as well um 
she really is. Deborah's a great example for women in ministry and how to balance things because I think it's easier for men in ministry because they've got the woman at home looking after everything yeah. and holding everything together while they're out working. And yes, a woman in ministry still has to do the ministry, but come home and still do the things as well. So That's yeah, true. It, is, it is tough. It, re mm. it, it really is tough, but very rewarding as long as you know you're called yeah. by God. Exactly. Yes. And I think yeah. it's just something for it's not really to tell men what to do but what you said g i think sometimes it just helps if people are really aware of obviously i don't know i'm not a woman in ministry like that or even married but sometimes you know sometimes if people talked about these things to their partners and say look you know i could do with some help here or there mm -hmm. or it would just be nice for men if your wife is doing all this preaching and all that stuff and then she comes home and she still has to do so much it's just energy draining so mm -hmm. if you're a man with a woman in ministry, please just check on your wife, see that she's all right. And, you know, mm -hmm. just keep that burden a little bit with her. It helps. It helps everybody. Mm -hmm. And if you're a woman in ministry, don't put your ministry yeah. before your family. Oh, no, no, no. Your family. Yeah. Well, first, first, it's, first and foremost. I'm just going to put that out there. Because they, ministry, they always some, say your some women are like, you know, oh, there's a, there's a no. prayer meeting in church today. Oh, yes, there's a vigil. But the children haven't had dinner. There's no yeah, dinner on the yeah. table. No. You've not you spoken to your husband all day. Yeah. A friend of mine told me something interesting, and I think it's particularly with women and church activities. And I think it's a Catholic parish where <laughs> the priests had actually capped the number of groups that women can be involved in. I think married <laughs> women to two. <laughs> because he said it was. You can't be spending all your time doing things mm. in church and your family mm. life is suffering. Yeah. Mm. And I think also you see this a lot with women, but I think also with men and men kind of get away with it a little bit. I remember watching a documentary, I think it was something on YouTube where they were saying that there's a particular very prominent minister mm. who did stuff all around the world, but, you know, his family ended up resenting him mm. because he just wasn't really there for them. So you can share your life with the whole world and I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing for God mm -hmm. but you find that a lot more of the younger ministers are really beginning to address this because some of them have ended up with divorces mm, and just sure. children are unruly because they mm -hmm. didn't have their and this even happens even in the secular world you should speak to the mm -hmm. children of politicians a mm -hmm. lot of them resent their parents mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. this yeah yeah that's interesting and I mean also De Deborah's obedience stands out to me here like she's obedient to God and there's no sense of pride because mm -hmm. you know I I, I I look at this and I then and then I think back to Moses and God saying to Moses to go down from the mountain and when they're complaining that they need water and strike the rock and then Moses does it but then God punishes him because I think he takes the credit for it and I think I think there's well there's obviously there's a debate going on about whether um, Moses doesn't why doesn't Moses see the the promised land is it because you know he struck the rock instead of um or was it because he took credit for for striking the rock so I thought it was because he struck the rock I thought it was because he yeah, had anger that's what he that's what other people say but there's a school of thought that says it's because when he did it he turned around and said there's something that he's done for them like he's given them water so yeah. he took credit for what God did not necessarily yeah. saying God has done this uh, okay um, I never looked at the angle and it's interesting because when I think back on that, and I, 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 I also look at Deborah, she's so humble that Barak is actually humble. saying to her, come with me to the battle. And she's yeah. like, but I've already told you what God has said. Like, you know, like, you go. Right. <laughs> I don't need to be there. God's yeah. already there. Um, exactly. But that's like a, a certain kind of humility because there's so many um, preachers and pastors out there that, the temptation is to be like Moses in that yeah. in that minute. You know, Moses is a great man of God. I'm not going to reduce his whole ministry to that minute. But the temptation is to have that that moment where you feel like, you know, if you're not there in the battle, the battle will not be won. I mm. think we need to have mm. a Deborah's kind of heart to say, I don't need to be in the battle. Like it's a That's privilege for me to even be in the battle, you know. And and um, it's interesting because. I've been speaking to a few women this week and they were like, oh, you know, you're doing so well and the podcast and the ministry and this, that and the other is going so well. 
and I've just I just said like God will do it without me like I'm I'm privileged like we as an admin yeah. team are privileged to be in this battle this side of heaven like God will do it without us he like it's it's for us like it's for our own good that we're engaged in this and and mm-hmm. we're doing this because it edifies us it encourages us and of course it you know it, it touches hearts and it and it wins souls over but that's not why we're doing it we're doing it because because if we don't do it he'll find somebody else to do it and yeah, that kind good. of that kind of humility is that's a Deborah kind of humility she was like God has told you back to go like you don't need me exactly. there exactly like All God right. will do She's it like, regardless of me. <laughs> yeah. Like the outcome is yeah. not reliant on me. And I think for me, that's like a big, that's a big thing, certainly as a leader, because there's the temptation there to always be like, I, I have to do this. Or if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Or um, God has spoken to me. So if I'm not there, then that's not going to happen. Or the war's not going to get won. But she quite clearly heard from God. She obeyed him. She passed on the thing that the message to Barack and then even when Barack was saying you come with me she was like oh you go you know but then but then she was also humble enough to go along with him yeah wasn't sure yeah and not get in the way and not act like move aside you know I'm here (laughs) and I think that's a real oh she's frozen I know internet's playing up Oh, oh girl, your internet's playing up, but um, we'll carry on and then she'll join us, oh. when she? Oh, well. Oh yes, you're back. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I, I was I could hear you both very well. All right. Yeah. So I was saying that it's a very good point you brought about leadership because it's something that I won't say I've never thought about, but you just brought it to my consciousness in a in a really strong way. Like God would do this thing without you. Oh. <laughs> so without you. And once you realize that you really are not all that, like you are not that important, you are important, but you are not oxygen to God, put it that way. (laughs) You're so not all that. Yeah, because you know what? Sometimes we can all get ahead of ourselves. Mm. And I think it's really important to know that you so are not all that to God. Mm. It will break his heart to let you go, but he will do it if he has to. And if you look at it like that, you will really begin to approach everything, like you said, Sidoni, as a privilege. Because as human beings, right, it's normal that sometimes you can get proud. So I just wanted to say that, yeah, that that, that point really touched me. I felt like I need to remind myself of this. With or without me, this train will keep going. It will. It will. Because, you know, and, and, and life will keep going. Like, you know, well, if something was to happen to every, anybody today, you know, life yeah. keeps going. And I think it's humbling. humbling. Very humbling. It's, it's humbling. Very like, I find it humbling. and and and. the more I ponder my mortality and the more I ponder how insignificant I am in the great scheme of things the more I marvel at such love that God has for me that he would send Mm. his son to die for me because I am so insignificant in the grand scheme of things and but then I'm so insignificant that the contrast compared to his love makes me so valuable that I just think Mm. that's mind-blowing like it is mind-blowing you're um, very important yeah it's almost like how we should treat i want to say like relationships where you give everybody your all but not make them the be all and end all sort mm, of thing i think that's mm, where it comes from and mm, i think even just for as leaders whether you're leading in church or even in a secular situation because as christians right we should be carrying our values into anywhere Mm -hmm. We should really think about this with leadership because I think many of us have really misinterpreted what a leader is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Jesus who says we shouldn't lord it over people. But Mm -hmm. can you imagine someone like Deborah, right, with a worldly mindset? Are you joking? Like everybody would have or you you heard that you heard God what and that's the point, Sidney. Just because you heard God, right, doesn't mean that it's even for you to do the action. But there are people who, yes, they heard God, but they didn't ask God, okay, God, is it Mm -hmm. me to do this thing or somebody Mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. it's like something that involves power, Mm -hmm. something that's going to be glamorous and go down Mm -hmm. in history. Oh, I want to be at the forefront. But Mm -hmm. Deborah didn't mind stepping back. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Because sometimes as a leader, God, God God will use you 
to A, bring glory to his name, but he'll use you to bring out the best in your surroundings. Like yeah. God, that you're, as a leader, you are a servant. Like, yes. As a leader, your utmost concern is not about your, um, like your own advancement and your own yeah. praises and everything that comes to you. As a leader, your concern is serving the people that have been entrusted in your care, whether that's a ministry or any 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 leadership role, your utmost concern should be serving them in such a way that you bring out the best of them to God's glory. Mm. So then wow. you can step aside and say, God, see what you've helped me achieve and see how these people worship you and live for you because of the things that you have been able to achieve for them through me like it's it's, as a leader you almost sort of lay down your life and you sacrifice your time your talent your resources you sacrifice all of that just so that other people can almost sort of like step on you to give God glory and I think Deborah is a really good example of that sacrificial servant leadership where she lays down and in complete obedience she lays down her own pride um, but that does not mean that she then goes against the natural order of things she's still a wife mm, yeah. and she's still a wife to the to the point where you know obviously the, the scripture remembers her husband mm-hmm. um, in favorable terms you know it's not like Abigail's husband who's described I think at one point in the bible is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and I can't it's, wait until we get to the J in the book and we, get, uh, we, we talk about Yael that's my favorite personality in the bible she's just too much but you know what you see a woman like abigail right and even okay we'll talk about jail later let's not do a spoiler for those who don't know but Mm -hmm. it just shows you that god like god doesn't respect any conventions man and i think that's my favorite thing about god like god can be gangster when he needs to be Oh, there she goes again with that word, gangster. Oh, God. <laughs> gangster. Let's face it, you know, <laughs> he's a gangster. Like, he mm. would just do, because I, I can imagine, right? They don't tell us, but can you imagine, like, God raising <laughs> Deborah to be a judge? I'm sure there were men in Israel who were not happy about You were not happy, yeah. So, I'm sure there were men that were thinking, probably, who does she think she is? I mean, you don't I, know I, what could have happened, right? But maybe God even had to go around and tell a few people off and say, look, <laughs> Um, mm. it's really me but mm. it just shows you that like we said the good thing about god is that he's the creator right he will create anything and any situation mm. and if you think that you know you've been called to do this thing be you male or female and you don't want to do it he will break convention however it suits him and i yep. think to me that's the most exciting thing about the bible because mm. it's god use very unusual methods mm. to do things mm. and i just mm. love that god is is like you know how all these people say they want a, a, a lover who is spontaneous and all that? I think God mm. is very spontaneous. You never God know what he's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies, it is 20 past oh, 10. Wow, it's been a and, wonderful and, conversation. And, and some of the mm-hmm. ladies are leaving the, the, the live stream chat. They're all the way to bed. Mm. They're going to bed. Oh, oh thank ladies. you, ladies. Thanks. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, As always. Shall we pray our way out? Yes. yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to um, learn what it is that you have for us to learn from Deborah in the Bible, um, from her leadership to her role acceptance, um, and just the way she was able to obey you, but also um, occupy the roles, her God-given roles that you gave her on earth um, as a wife, um, possibly as a mother, but as a prophetess and as a judge um, and and Lord, all these things she was able to balance, Lord. We ask that you would give us the same strength, the same wisdom to be able to balance all the different roles that you give us in our lives, wherever we find ourselves as employees, as sisters, as wives, as husbands, as cousins, as parents and grandparents and aunties. Um, Lord, we ask that you would help us, Lord, to be able to balance all these roles, Lord. Help us to be able to lay down our lives um, whatever roles that we find ourselves Lord um lay down our lives so that others may be able to know you and get to to know you may our pride not be a stumbling block that would prevent the good news from spreading and prevent other people from knowing you 
We ask, Lord, that you'd be with each and every one of us, Lord, until next week. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Everyone in Facebook Amen. land. Thank night. you. Good night, ladies. Night, everyone. And good night, everybody Amen. on Zoom land.